Yes? Can we start it? Começamos? Ok, uh, boa tarde a todas e a todos. É com muito prazer que iniciamos a sessão, é, essa sessão, agora à tarde. Eu gostaria de introduzir é, os colegas. A mesa redonda tem como tema... Okay. Tem como tema uh, o serviço social na luta contra as opressões ao redor do mundo. E é, esse foco, essa mesa foi pensada na comissão organizadora é, e com muito carinho nós vamos hoje contar com a presença da professora Dawn Bel Belkins, uh, da Boston, depois eu vou fazer a introdução uh, do, do, uh, do currículo de cada uma, a professora Dimitra Dora Teloni, da Universidade de Athens, na Grécia, e do professor Davidson, daqui da Unifesp, da Baixada Santista. Uh, I'd like to say a uh, warm, warm welcome to our uh, social policy meeting. It's a pleasure for us to introduce our panel uh, on this afternoon. Uh, we'd like to say a uh, welcome for um, Dora Dimitra Teloni or Dimitra Dora Teloni, sorry, she's an assistant professor of social work at the Department of Social Work at the University of West Attica, Athens, Greece. She's a social work PhD from the University of Liverpool. She's a member of the editorial board of Critical and Radical Social Work Journal and a review in the International Journal Journal of Social Work and European Journal of Social Work. She's a member of Greek Social Work Action Network and International Social Action Network. And she is uh, participating in some uh, community action project in, uh, around the, the, the Greece. The second uh, speaker, cannot speaker today, will be Dawn Belkins Martinez. Uh, she's a um, clinical associate, associate professor, so associate dean of equity and inclusion at Boston University School of Social Work and the co-author of the book Social, Social Justice in Clinical Practice, a Liberation Health Framework for Social Work. She's a founding member of Boston Liberation Health Group and participate in the coordinate committee of the, the National Social Work Action Network. And uh, Professor uh, Davidson, um, she, uh, he is a sociologist, P, 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 sociology. He's professor at the University, uh, Federal University of uh, Sao Paulo with the campus uh, uh, is in Santos City and his research of Núcleo Reflexos de Palmares and Núcleo de Estudos Afro-Brasileiros. Ambos, uh, both are in uh, Unifes in Sao Paulo. Nowadays, he has in research, teaching and community activities about racism and institutional racism. So it's amazing to introduce all of you and explain. We will start with uh, Dimitri Dora Teloni, and after that, uh, we will uh, have a, a presentation from Dan, and finally, Davidson will uh, are doing his presentation. In the end, all the comments, all the questions could be in the chat in YouTube. And if you have any problems to understand the language, please let us know, because I, we will try to support. Uh, Bem-vindos, bem-vindas, boa sessão. Uh, o desafio hoje é nos entendermos. I'm explaining that the, the challenge today is to understand each other. So good, good, 
a panel I'd like to introduce. She's a friend of mine. I met her in Southern Sea uh, two years ago. And uh, Vasilius uh, introduced me, Dimitra Dora Teloni, and we have some activities together in the Social Work Action Network. Welcome, Dora. Uh, I don't know if you know, but last year we invited uh, Dimitra Dora to come to Brazil, but unfortunately, it's not pos it, it was not possible in that time. But today he is with us. Welcome to Brazil. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Maria Lucia. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for all this very warm welcome. And uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate you, all of you and the committee about this wonderful conference. And you have done all of you an amazing work despite these difficult times. So thank you. I'm very happy to be here with you today. I will try to, to speak slow. So in case that you have any problem to understand me, please just uh, say that. So the title of my presentation is Refugee Crisis, Social Work and the Movements. I will first discuss the so-called as refugee crisis across Europe. I will then proceed in presenting the response of social work. Then I will briefly present some of the responses of the anti-racist movement in Greece. Finally, I will address the need for anti-racist social work and the need to link social work with the movements in our modern times where we see a rise of racism, fascism, poverty and inequality across the globe. So both migration to Europe and US and immigration policies precedes the so-called as refugee crisis. Yet, since 2015, we have been witnessing Europe's inability to put forth sustainable migratory policies. Instead, European migration policies not only failed, but they created a structural... Sorry, can you hear me? Sorry. Uh... Okay. I, I just heard something, sorry. Um, instead, European migration policies not only failed, but they created a structural violence which systematically repressed the vulnerable populations. In response to the influx of over 1 million refugees fleeing war and prosecution that arrived in Greece between 2015 and 2016, the EU, the European Union, decided to close the Balkan borders, trapping refugees along the routes and concluded an agreement with Turkey, accelerating deportation of asylum seekers to Turkey. The hostile immigration policies led to over 13,000 people dying or missing in the Mediterranean Sea in an attempt to reach Europe via dangerous sea routes. In addition, these policies led to the unequal distribution of the refugee population within Europe, trapping refugees in southern member states. At the same time, the southern states are unable to properly address the needs of the refugees. Thus, it may be said that those who survive their journey remain lost. For instance, in Greece, the living conditions are derivable, not only due to the refugees' detentions in extremely overcrowded hotspots with poor and unhealthy conditions and are exposed to sexual harassment with no protection, but also their asylum procedures are being mismanaged and they have limited access to information regarding the developments of their case. 
These challenges undoubtedly have negative implication to refugees' life on multiple levels. You will now watch a short video about the situation uh, in one of the camps. So please, Matt, can you put the video? It's about refugees in one of the camps in Greece. Uh, there is no sound. I'm here at Moria Camp on Lesbos Island in Greece, where we've been documenting the situation of refugees, asylum seekers and migrants. Living here in a camp with a capacity for 3,000 that's now housing over 14,000 people. Big issue for the women here is the issue about uh, safety and security. Many of the women that visit us, uh, they are victims of rape or uh, different kind of violence. They have been facing this in their countries of their origin. They face the same during the travel and at some point Europe is not able to protect them from this kind of violence in the camps. Many women and girls, even the most vulnerable, are living in horrific conditions. This includes pregnant women, women who've experienced violence, and women who are here on their own. I've been going to the house, and 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 I've been Women are supposed to be housed in special sections for single women, but due to the amount of people arriving to the islands, people were sleeping on the streets. And when they're finally housed, there's no space in the section, so they're given a tent. This tent is sometimes put in between single men, and we have had clients that were even sleeping in the same tent as single men. <laughs> زندگی بدون پدر خیلی سخت بود با آمدن در اینجا خیلی سخت تر شده برای ما که ستاییم The lives of women and girls we spoke to in the camp are dictated by fear. The Greek government should urgently take action to uphold basic rights and safety for all women and girls in Moria. Other EU member states should also share responsibility for welcoming asylum seekers and migrants arriving in Europe. Okay, this camp is referred by the refugees as hell. The refugees call it hell due to these awful living conditions. A fire broke in 2020 in this camp. The Greek government was fast to build a new camp in Karatepe, which also has similar terrible living conditions. The government, the Greek government, follows a preventive doctrine, which means that the, the refugees should live in very bad living conditions and systematically violating their human rights, including children's rights. During the pandemic of COVID-19, the situation only got worse as it is further minimized the means to protect refugees and even resulted to even more human rights violations, such as forbidding the refugees from leaving the camp. The use of the term crisis by the EU and policyholders to depict the large influx of refugees in the summer of 2015 did not intend only to highlight the fact that millions of people were migrating. Instead, within the context of public discourse, the term refugee crisis created the sense of danger and depicted the refugee as a threat to the security of the European citizens.
While the term was used in 2015, a similar large influx of Afghani refugees occurred even prior to 2010 as a result of the wars of United States and Europe in Afghanistan. Thousands of refugees arrived in Greece and elsewhere in Southern Europe in an attempt to reach Northern Europe. Therefore, was not, what has not been mentioned in the public discourse are the causes such as the anti-migratory policy for Eastern Western military interven interventions, the role of colonialism on the political instability in the countries of origins of the migrants, and how this political instability is directly related to the increase of inequality and poverty that lead to the waves of migrants and refugees. It is important to put forth the causes of migration and of the conditions of refugees, which are both a result of hostile policies against refugees. Understanding the structural causes of the crisis is imperative for both social workers and our societies, as it will allow us all to become more accustomed with the fact that we will be all living together. The EU's hostile policies cultivated and prepared the ground for the far right to flourish creating a particularly dangerous amalgam for migrants, not only in Greece, but across Europe. One of the fruits of this dangerous amalgam in Greece was the Golden Dawn, which have attacked consistently migrants during the previous years, including the more well-known murders of Lukman of Pakistani origin and Fisas of Greek origin, who was an anti-fascist. It is worth mentioning that it was not until October 2020 that the Golden Dawn was sentenced for murdering Lukman and Pavlos. This is five and a half years later, and after an intense struggle within the justice system, which was mainly supported by the anti-racist and anti-fascist movement. During the so-called refugee crisis, the social work and the official social services in regard to the immigrant population were being challenged throughout Europe. From issues regarding communication due to the lack of efficient translators, which led to issues of information, specialist services for refugees and uncompanied children, to the quality of the social services, which stems not only from the limited or unappropriated training of the social workers, but also due to the precarious working conditions and lack of funding. In an effort to raise awareness, international bodies of social work, such as the European Association of Schools Social Work, which organized a campaign in cooperation with Social Work Action Network, announcements and forums by the International Federation of Social Works, etc. Within the Greek context, our research that has been published in 2020 revealed a number of worrying issues related to social workers who worked with refugees during the refugee crisis. Namely, the social workers had to perform under hard working conditions. They were young and lacked previous experience. They had to address a complexity of problems, but had limited access to solutions and lacked resources. They were not provided with supervision, despite having a large number of complex cases and lack of resources. And finally, the majority of social workers worked by programs funded by EU and NGOs and not public social services. Consequently, social workers find themselves fighting without weapons throughout the decades due to the neoliberal policies. Social workers do their best in day-to-day -day practice to help refugees. However, with such hostile policies against refugees, lack of welfare provision, as well as hard working conditions and precarity, social work is in a rather difficult position. 
Unions of social workers in NGOs had repeatedly participated in strikes and protests for the refugees' living conditions. Social Work Action Network in Greece participated in campaigns for the right of refugees, in demonstrations, and continuously publishing reports and statements. We also participated in grassroots welfare strikes that were run by the anti racist movement and we are in solidarity with the refugees. Interestingly, our research has also shown that the majority of social workers that work with refugees are connected with the anti racist movement. This is important for social work, social work, sorry. But let's talk about the anti racist movement a little bit and what are those elements that render it in a rather interesting and relevant for social work. In general, the anti racist movement has a long tradition in Greece, especially in the 90s, engaging on both micro and macro level. These two levels of action are also common with social work. Solidarity and resistance are key elements in the anti racist movement's action. If we were if we were to use and apply the social works terminology on the anti racist reactions, it may be argued that on a micro level, all their actions focus on solidarity, creating grassroots welfare initiatives, such as providing free Greek courses to migrants, establishing information centers with solidarity lowers, solidarity kitchen where we cook and eat together. In regards to the macro, to the bigger level, to the level of uh, um, pressing the policies, the anti racist movement focuses on the political action and political struggle. For example, the anti racist movement for more than two decades, creative initiatives such anti racist collective action, campaigns for the right of refugees, demonstrations, petitions, advocacy, and raising awarenesses. Files complaints to the authority for racist attacks active in communicating to the media the situation both in Greece and abroad by the anti racist movement. During the refugee crisis in 2015 and 2016, the anti racist movement had an important role to play. It was on the front line in the islands, saving people and accompanying refugees to the northern part of the country, and later focusing on housing and education. Therefore, there are now new forms of action where squads in Athens and elsewhere have been created in order to respond to the fact that vulnerable people were homeless. To name some of them squads, City Plaza, Notara Squad, etc., are some examples of alternative housing projects which empower people through, through their daily life, advocating for children's right to go to school, collectively decide for the needs and the practical problems, and collectively struggle against oppression. Campaigns against the inhuman conditions in hotspots and anti racist and anti fascist action were and still are part of the agenda of the movement. Moreover, the anti racist and anti fascist movement played a particular important role in the struggle against fascism in Greece during the previous years and contributed significantly to the prison sentence of the neo Nazi leaders of the Golden Dawn Party. Social Work Action Network in Greece issued a statement that called for the conviction of Golden Dawn members titled, Social Work Cannot But Stand for the Fascism. Following the call, members of SWAN, but also social work professionals and students, along with over 20,000 people stood outside the Greek court to support the conviction of the Golden Dawn. The prison sentence of Golden Dawn's leadership and the recognition that Golden Dawn was a criminal organization was a victory for the anti racist movement in Greece, which took many years of struggle. It is important that we bear in mind 
that this, along with Trump's defeat, paved a new path, which proves that people's mobilization and political action maybe bring significant change. If social work is by default anti-racist and anti-fascist, it cannot but be an ally and supporter of the movement. Historically, social movements had an important impact on social work in theory and practice. Social work has a lot to learn from the social movements. Recognize, for example, the political causes of the personal problems of our users. Social work scholarship does not always view issues such as poverty, structural inequality and institutional racism as central to our mandate. Thus, these issues are insufficiently in addressed. Social workers need initially to recognize the socio and political causes of poverty that their users are battling with. Because when the problems are individualized, we reproduce discriminatory practices, as Maria Lucia Garcia and Maria Zelama de Aurora Madeira has said. The multicultural social work approaches, albeit helpful, in a sense, they provide many ways to address education, focusing on issues on diversity despite structural or institutional racism. It is true that social workers do their best in helping effectively in a micro level. However, if social work is there to tackle structural racism, this cannot be achieved by professionals that work alone, lost between the cases and bureaucracy. Therefore, there is a need for collective action. This includes participation in unions, but it is also necessary to create coalition with the movements. See, for example, the Black Lives Matter movement, as Don will say, women's movement in Chile and so on. Organizing resistant practices and strategies of resilience are common practice in the movement. This is a place for social work action and its users. Case advocacy is an integral part of social work practice. It is not enough, however. Social workers need to work on the level of cause advocacy, which focus on the causes that generate the problems within the society and by extension to the users. Anti-racist social work needs to be part of the social work agenda across the world. Anti-racist social work cannot but be anti-fascist. The rise of fascism and racism across the world further highlights the urgency for a political and anti-fascist action within the realm, within the realm of social work. We might all agree that social work needs to raise, raise its voice and act politically. After all, political action is part of the global social work agenda. However, this cannot be achieved by technocratic or bureaucratic social services, and certainly not by exhausted social scientists that are isolated in their offices, overworked and facing alone the dead ends of the hostile policies against the poor. Collective action and solidarity are integral part of the social work practice, either via unions, the communities, user groups, or in the movements. However, solidarity is not just announcements. Therefore, the social work action network in Greece, we will soon start to provide supervision for free in frontline social workers that work with refugees. This is just an example of solidarity. Social workers are, are social work, uh, have the scientific knowledge. For example, we know how to gather data. We know how to provide justification for the violation of human rights. We have the knowledge on community work. We know how to advocate and work on empowerment. On the other hand, the social justice movements offer the political dimension of the causes of the social problems and also act collectively and politically. The interplay among these actors is particularly important in this moment of history, where there is a race of inequality, poverty and austerity. 
and race of racism and fascism. There are common interests and values among social work and social movement. Common day-to-day -day practice. This coalition needs to be further advanced and become part of the social work agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dora. It's uh, amazing. I, I just remember all of you in, a, in our na National Council of Social Work uh, put in our principle, the fundamental principle of the ethical code of social workers in Brazil, we, uh, the recognition of freedom as core ethical value and the second, resolution defense of human rights and refuse of authorities. So, uh, it's a clear message. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and uh, immediately, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Dan Belkins from Boston University. Please. Let us know. I just, I just want to, to tell a, a few words before, sorry, down um, in Portuguese. Uh, colegas, a, a ideia uh, desta mesa é exatamente nos colocar diante do desafio da comunicação entre diferentes línguas. Mas a mensagem é muito clara. A ideia é de que a gente possa tentar se entender. Uh, e diante dos ataques, nós tivemos 75% dos nossos recursos cortados. Então, essa, a resistência está exatamente em fazer o evento e brilhar o evento. I just telling the, the audience that we, the, the Brazilian government, decided to cut 75% of the fund to support this event. So, to organize and to stay together, it's an example of the resistance of all of us. So, please, down. Bring us with your <laughs> speech, please. Bona tarde, colegas. <laughs> I am honored to speak at the 8th International and 15th National Social Policy Meeting in Victoria Espirito Santo, Brazil. Thank you so much to my colleague, uh, Luisa Garcia, and all of the members of the organizing committee for inviting me to talk about social work in the United States and the Black Lives Matter movement. Social work in my country, and I would add the vast majority of countries around the world, is conducted in the oppressive system of racial capitalism. Karl Marx wrote that capitalism comes into the world dripping from head to toe from every pore with blood. Nowhere is this truer than in the United States with its long history of settler colonialism in North America, the genocidal destruction of its indigenous people, the theft of their land, slavery and imperialism. The result was a particularly virulent form of capitalism the North American historian Robert D.J. Kelly writes that capitalism developed and operates within a racial system or racial regime. Racism is fundamental for the production and reproduction of violence, and that violence is necessary for creating and maintaining capitalism. While violence, physical, economic, and social against black bodies and communities has been a core component of the United States political project, so too has been resistance. The history of racial capitalism is simultaneously a history of organized resistance at every level, from individual acts to broad scale multiracial working class movements. The resistant struggles of indigenous people, led by the heroes such as Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse of the Lakota, of course the famous warrior Geronimo of the Apache, revolts on slave ships, Nat Turner's slave rebellion, 
Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad and the Black freedom struggle during Reconstruction following the Civil War. The mass resistance of Mexican people in the American Southwest after the theft of their land resulting from the US imperialist war against Mexico. And of course, the modern day civil rights movement beginning in the 1960s, which saw the rise of movements and, and organizations such as the Black Panther Party, La Raza Unida, Young Lords Party, and so many others. Black Lives Matters stands on the shoulder of the history of these and many other movements for liberation. Black Lives Matter arose to address a particular egregious form of racist oppression, the murder of Black Americans by the police. In 2013, three radical Black women, Alicia Garza, Patricia Cullors, Opel Tomedi, initiated a political project following the acquittal of George Zimmerman, who murdered the African-American teenager, Trayvon Martin. This is an all too common phenomenon in American society. According to a recent study from the American Academy of Sciences, police violence is the leading cause of death for young men in the United States. Over the life course, about one in every thousand black male can be expect to be killed by the police. The limited statistics we have indicate that the police in the US killed 164 black people in the first eight months of 2020. And given the racist nature of the legal system in the United States, few of these cops face any legal consequences for their crime. The Black Lives Matter movement has had a dramatic impact on American society bringing hundreds of thousands of people out into the streets in big cities and small towns from coast to coast, demanding an end to police murder, racist policing, and the legal systems that aid and abet them. It is this racial capitalist order which social workers in the United States confront in their daily practice. Its adverse impacts both profoundly affect the individuals the families and communities with which we work and simultaneously limit our abilities to effectively support them. Social workers are frequently unprepared to understand, let alone confront this reality because we were trained in institutions, colleges and universities, which are themselves component elements of the racial capitalist order and which consequently reproduce the ideology in their social work teaching. Nevertheless, social workers, if they transform their consciousness and their practice can play a critical role in confronting and helping to dismantle racial capitalism. First, by working with individuals and communities to grasp the multiple ways racial capitalism systems and practices are implicated in the problems that bring these individuals and families to the social worker. Second, by working with individuals and communities to encourage and support them in actively participating in social practices and groups that challenge racial capitalism's adverse impact on their lives and the lives of other oppressed and exploited people or as the beloved Paulo Freire would say, becoming subjects and not objects. Third, by organizing other social workers and healthcare professionals to become active anti-racist fighters and to join with other activists in the dismantling of racial capitalism. I am going to talk about three important battles social workers are currently waging together with the Black Lives Matter movement and other allies. The first one is defund the police and abolition. Demands to transform, defund, abolish the police have been central to the Black Lives Matter movement. 
This is not only because of the violence police departments inflict upon people of color, but also because of the excessive amount of money spent on so-called law enforcement rather than social services. Since the 1960s, municipal governments have increasingly spent large portions of their budget on law enforcement. By 2020, the US cities collectively spend 115 billion per year on policing. For many cities, policing is their largest or near largest expense. For example, in Los Angeles in 2020, the LA Police Department budget constituted 18% and about 54% of the city's general funds. In Chicago in 2020, the Chicago Police Department constituted 18% of the city's budget and 40% of the city's general funds. In Oakland, California, about 41% of the general funds went to the Oakland Police Department. Defund the police is a slogan that supports divesting funds from police departments and reallocating them to non-policing forms of public safety and community support, such as social services, youth services, housing, education, healthcare, and other community resources. Other demands to reform policing involve greater community control over police departments, an end to police immunity from prosecution for their criminal behavior, and criminal justice reform. These issues are important to radical social workers and not just because of our commitment to racial justice. In all too many cases, the police officers are deployed as first responders in mental health crises. One study found that about 21% of the average police officer's time is spent responding to or transporting people with mental illness. Moreover, one in four people who are killed by the police have severe mental illness. This is an intolerable situation that social workers and our allies are fighting to change. In Chicago, social workers from Social Service Workers United are organizing alongside Black Lives Matter activists to defund the Chicago Police Department. They have circulated an open letter to the National Association of Social Workers demanding that social workers stop collaborating with police departments and publicly support the Black Lives Matter petition to defund police and invest in community. The second activity social workers are doing is meeting material needs. Racial capitalism has always meant that people of color suffer systemic discrimination in employment, housing, education, and healthcare. The current pandemic and resulting economic crisis it has brought about is making the situation worse. African Americans in the US are twice as likely to die from COVID than whites. In some states, they are three or more times likely to die. Latinos overrepresented in frontline jobs, which increase their exposure to the virus, are four times more likely to be hospitalized for COVID than whites. Black Lives Matter, social workers, and our allies have been finding creative ways to respond to this situation. Here are some of the most interesting and inspiring examples. Mutual aid. There's a strong movement which has sprung up and many social workers are involved both at the local level and in national service. Mutual aid efforts are promoting a variety of activities, including building neighborhood food delivery, financial support, social support for the elderly, free counseling services for those undergoing stress, and concrete support for those immigrants in detention and those incarcerated. Housing. Across the country, many renters and homeowners, disproportionately people of color, are unable to pay for their housing. In April, 
Um, a survey said that 66% of Latinos reported that someone in their household had experienced a wage or job loss as a result of the pandemic. Nearly half of all Black and 44% of all Latinos surveyed indicated that they could not pay all of their monthly bills. Social work activists are organizing with the goal to secure people's right to remain in their home for the duration of the crisis and until the economy begins to recover. Demands related to this effort include state and local governments imposing the following, a freeze on the collection of all rents and utility payments, a suspension of mortgage or on owner occupied and rental housing, and a moratorium on all evictions and foreclosures. Where I live in Boston, social workers are heavily involved in the fight for rent forgiveness and an eviction moratorium. Healthcare. The United States shares with South Africa the distinction of being the only industrialized nation without universal health insurance. Almost 20% of the non-elderly population in this country lacks health insurance at any given time. And the disparities in access to care and health outcomes are very much greater in the United States than anywhere else where there is data, particularly as regards to people of color. Activists across the nation are demanding comprehensive national health insurance and working to pressure the incoming Biden administration to make health care reform a national priority. They are also organizing around these immediate demands that the healthcare system and treatment for the coronavirus be made available to all the people, no exceptions. That the government must subordinate the private health, sure, he, private health system to the needs to fight the pandemic, nationalizing healthcare institutions if necessary. For the health and safety, the government must take immediate steps to release confined persons who are unable to practice social distancing. This includes prisoners and detained immigrants. The final activity that social workers in the United States are involved in is the development and implementation of radical social work theory and practice. In the United States, it is estimated that up to 65% of all mental health services are provided by social workers. As the crisis of neoliberalism deepens, its impact on the social work profession has been ongoing and dramatic. Neoliberalism and its US system of private corporate insurance dominated healthcare in theory and practice are fundamentally antithetical to social work's ethical foundation. They promote a model of social work, which by privileging individualism and personal self-reliance has a corrosive impact on social workers and the individuals, families, and communities in which we work. While the field of anti-oppressive practice has exploded in the last 10 years, with growing awareness of the intersections of race, class, and gender, many of these theories have only begun to develop the necessary tools for practical assessments and clinical interventions. There is an urgent need to seize the moment provided by the current crisis to connect the dots for people, to show how police violence and racial oppression are part and parcel of a system being racked by the interconnected and mutually reinforcing crises, a planetary environmental crisis, the social crisis created by wealth inequality, and the crisis created by a for-profit healthcare system render governments and social systems not just unable to effectively respond to the pandemic, but profoundly dysfunctional across the board. In Boston, social workers working collaboratively with individuals and families have helped develop a theory of practice, which we call liberation health, that is counter hegemonic to the theories and practice of neoliberalism and racial capitalism. Drawing on the writings and practical work of Paulo Freire, Antonio Gramsci, Ignacio Martin Barro, Black feminist intersectional theory, and the historical activism of the rank and file social work movement, the liberation health model is a product of our current social, economic, and political crisis. 
This method of problem posing, problem analysis, and action planning provides social workers and social service users with practical tools to deconstruct the dominant worldview messages influencing their lives and take action to liberate themselves from internal and external oppression. The Boston Liberation Health Group is now 19 years old and has almost 2,000 members worldwide. Some of you attending the conference are members, and I would encourage anyone who is interested to join our Facebook group. Our monthly Zoom meetings are open to all. Our mission is to build, disseminate, and advocate and practice liberation health theory through clinical practice, direct action, and community building in order to support socialist liberation, dismantle all forms of oppression, and promote the healing of ourselves and our community. Our group has several different goals and projects. These include offering support and solidarity to anyone engaged in the struggle for liberation, particularly activists and organizers from oppressed or marginalized groups. Disseminate and educate healthcare providers and consumers in the theory and methodology of liberation health. And participate and delete lead direct action against injustice and support of the health of our communities, particularly in solidarity with oppressed people. These are just three different projects social workers in the United States have been involved with to stand in solidarity with Black Lives Matters. There are many more and I'm looking forward to our discussion later. In summary, it comes down to this. Social work must be a part of the multiracial working class movement to ultimately dismantle racial capitalism and build new systems for the liberation of us all. Because when we do this, black lives will finally matter. Mutia abrigato. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, finally, it's uh, uh, strong, strong panel. I'd like to introduce Davidson Faustino. Uh, he's a sociologist, uh, Dr. PhD in sociology and professor at Federal University of Sao Paulo, Baixada Santista. I'd like to say uh, two words in Portuguese. Uh, first of all, um, Primeiro, o professor Faustino Davidson, nós combinamos, ele fará a apresentação em inglês, é, que foi a, a modelagem dessa mesa, e ele terá um tempinho ao final em que fala, faz, fará uma síntese em português, para aqueles que tiverem é, alguma maior dificuldade em entendimento. Okay, uh, Dawn, thank you, thank you very much. And I, I introduce now Professor um, Davidson Falsino. Welcome, warm welcome, Davidson. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I, I am so happy for stay here uh, with, you, with you. Uh, I thanks for, for the invitation and the honor to, to being a part in this important international meeting. Uh, I greet professors Maria Lucia, Dimitra Dora, and Dal Belkin. And I, I will talk about the social issue because that is an important question here in, in Brazil. But my point will be the, uh, the social issue and the racial aspect of the class ex exploitation in Brazil. Uh, I, uh, uh, we, we can start with, with this photography. Uh, I don't know if, 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 can, if you can see that in your computer, but uh, uh, it, it is a perfect portrait of social issue in Brazil, because we, we have here a black man in a precarious job, while an, an white men are jogging during pandemic crisis, crisis of coronavirus. Uh, Brazil, are, Brazil is a, a black and indigenous culture, but white peoples 
controls most most space of power. This is the the racial aspect of social issue in Brazil. But uh, in, in fact, social issue is uh, above all an economic issue. I would like to to quote Professor Yamamoto about this when she said uh, social issue is understood as a set of expression of the inequality of mature capitalist society, which has, which has a common root. Uh, social production is increasing, uh, collective work becomes more widely social, while the appropriation of these freaks remains if private monopolized by a part of society. That's important for for us uh, because uh, the, the set of expression of inequality produced, pr produced by the contradiction between capital and labor, that's the central uh, issue for understand the, the social issue. And, uh, and, and, and these expressions are articulated in, in the, the uh, social metabolic complex of capital. However, there is a topic here in Brazil that often escapes from some anal analysis on the social issues. Uh, I am talking about racism and I will, I will talk about it. My key issues uh, are uh, one, uh, what's the place or function of racism in the reproduction of the complex socio-metabolic of capital? That's one question. But I, I want to talk about uh, what's the importance of racism for understanding the social issue in Brazil? Well, uh, I, I, start, I start calling about uh, reflection determination. That is a Marx uh, uh, category. Uh, that ca category uh, was used by Marx to think the dialectical relationship between different particular instances of social totality. Here, uh, uh, in this presentation, we, 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 we talk about the relationship between capitalism, colonialism, in ra and, and racism. Well, uh, capitalism is a, a social system, a historical social system, but uh, uh, it's important to think the importance uh, to colonialism, to capitalism reproduction. Marx said about that in the, the Capital, uh, when he said the importance of colonialism to primitive accumulation of capital. And, and for Marx, uh, the primitive accumulation of capital is marked by a violence, prey, appropriation, uh, it, that that's violence it was fundamental to universalization of capital. Uh, that that's violence uh, is part of colonial system, and the colonial system was important also to dismantling or submitting pre-capitalist relation of production. Uh, uh, Eric Williams said about uh, that that reality and said. Uh, the importance of slavery to reproducing of colonialism. Uh, for, for him, uh, uh, slavery was the most adequate form of production for colonialism. That is important for us because if we see capitalism only for an uh, reductive co uh, economic aspect, we cannot see the importance of racism in that pr pr process. I, I am not talking about racism only. I, I want to talk about capitalism, but my point is uh, 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 that it's important to understand the, 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 the rule of racism in the capitalism reproduction, because for colonialism uh, uh, work, uh, 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 slavery was fundamental, but uh, it's impossible to understand slavery without racism. Racism uh, was a, 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 a domini domination ideology that was part uh, an important moment of development of capital. Racism, racism uh, uh, was the ideology that allowed the conquest 
of the bourgeoisie revolution. Uh, uh, for example, the notion of citizenship and equal, equal dignity do not be socialized equally, uh, even in, inside the Europe. But when we think the world, uh, uh, racism uh, plays the important role to to differentiate people that that can be uh, thinked like human. Uh, uh, racism is, is uh, was in, in important to uh, uh, differentiate differentiate or distribute the uh, the co the the uh, 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 what I, I am trying to say is the uh, 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 racism create difficult to socialize. Uh, the, the 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 conquest the the uh, the achievement of uh, uh, bourgeoisie revolution only the cost of capitalism were socialized uh, by inequality and uh, misery and and wars uh, that is important for uh, for understand that, uh, 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 the role of racism in capitalism in capitalism because uh, racism is based uh, uh, by animalization of enslaved people, but after when when the slavery system uh, uh, end, the animalization continue operating in the in, in society. Racism put put important uh, uh, important role to uh, ideological support for the universalization of capital. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm here, uh, 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 many uh, thinkers talk about the importance we understand Eurocentrism in the process of uh, uh, of primitive accumulation of capital in in the process of colonialism, and that's important to understand Brazil because uh, our capitalism uh, is not the the uh, uh, our capitalism is a particular form of capitalism. Our capitalism was marked by colonial process. Uh, racism is fundament fundamental to understand capitalism in Brazil uh, because Brazilian capitalism was born from colonialism and slavery. That's market or uh, constitution. Uh, we did not have, for example, a, 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 bourgeois, a, a, a revolutionary bourgeoisie, for example like the French one, where the bourgeoisie bro uh, broke with the fe feudal backwardness uh, to place itself a, a, as a, a ruling class. We did, not, we did not have here a Prussian bourgeoisie that dis disputed the imperial domination of monopolist capitals, uh, in, as in the, in the case of Italy, Japan, Germany with the face fascism, for example, we did we did have it. We didn't have it. Uh, different from from these two cases, our capitalism is late comer, uh, and our bourgeoisie was born weak, was born as part of colonial process, just to serve a colonial and interest and imperialist interest. That result. Uh, the, the result was a, a society market by a over exploitation of the workforce. For example, Rui Mauro Marini uh, said about that. Uh, but the result also a kind of fragility of democrat democratic institution, uh, and uh, that fragility uh, is marked by alternation between restricted democracy and dictatorship. That's our history, our, our political history. Uh, we, we had that alternation. And especially a high concentration of income and uh, a social inequality as a rule. Uh, racism in that period, in that, that uh, uh, initial period, was important, uh, an important social barrier uh, and an instrument of unequal poverty distribution. But when we, we think the contemporary society marked by institutional crisis of capital, we have some uh, changing in that, in that process, but not good change. Uh, 
in the last de de decades, uh, Brazil was insert inserted in the globalization. I, I prefer calls uh, in, uh, about mundialization of capital. It was made by a subordinate manner. Uh, our colonial roots intensified the effect of structural crisis in capital. And in that process were, was marked by uh, dismantling uh, social and labor rights, increase of precarious work and income concentration, and a growing of the stagnant relative overpopulation. That is also a Marx category. The stagnant relative overpopulation uh, is part of the reserve industrial army that will never be absor absorbed. And here, again, racism have, have been a fundamental element to define who will or not will have a job, who can or cannot eat, who lives, who, who lives uh, and, uh, and who dies. Uh, the, the, uh, racism defined in Brazil, which immigrant will be welcome and which immigrant will be violated because our, our, our treatment for immigrants are different. If, if the immigrants uh, uh, is, is white or from US, for example, our treatment is one. But if the immigrant is from Haiti, is from uh, Angola, is from uh, uh, any country from Africa or Bolivia, for example, our treatment is, is different. It, it, that's important to understand uh, our history because our colonialism, or uh, sorry, our capitalism was marked by a ideology, a racist ideology, where our bourgeoisie believed that immigration could be uh, uh, put Brazil, uh, Brazil better because we could uh, 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 to be to be white, for example, our treatment, our our uh, uh, xenophobia are different uh, from xenophobia in Europe, for example, because racism differentiate uh, 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 which immigrant will, will be accept or not. Racism is the key to understand how it was possible to combine and mainly distribute and evenly the effects of the colonial way of Brazilian capitalism. Uh, uh, I, 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 I will not have time to talk about the, the role, for example, the, the governmental role in that process and, and to, to approach Lula government and differentiate with Bolsonaro. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, that uh, that uh, he represented a, a, a brief and ambiguous in, inflection. Uh, Lula government uh, is part of a brief and ambiguous in, inflection in this colonial uh, way of capitalist constitution. Uh, uh, in the process, in, in the process that that I am telling, uh, I, I I am sure you this graph, this chart. Uh, this chart shows the evolution of poverty and extreme poverty in the last decades. Uh, and we, we can see in the Lula and Dilma government uh, uh, a, a kind of decrease of uh, and extreme poverty. Uh, uh, and the, but... Uh, the, the Lula government was the, the most sophisticated expression of a class rec reconciliation, uh, a kind of pact called New Republic, and that creates a, a kind of, of, of dif difficult to this project. But this pact was broken with the parliamentary coup that uh, outset President Dilma. Today we have, we are uh, experience, experience, experiencing the implementation of an ultra liberal project marked by an uh, expansion of capitalist barbarism uh, and a dismantling uh, of social rights. And that's, that has uh, consequence in, in Brazilian response to pandemic, to coronavirus pandemic, for example. Uh, my point uh, is, 
uh, about racism because uh, uh, in Brazil uh, it's important to understand the the social issue because poverty is highlighted. I'm not talking. I'm not. I'm not saying that. Uh, the, uh, uh, for example, that uh, uh, the there isn't white people in, in poverty. It's not that. But when we, we, we see the framework of poverty in Brazil, there are a kind of racialization in that in that process. Uh, there are, but racism creates a kind of natur, natural, uh, racism naturalizes social inequalities, blame the victims, and offers unequal living condition. Uh, but uh, mainly, racism creates a kind of indifference to social inequality. Uh, uh, black people in Brazil are most affected by those are diseases that increase the risk for death for coronavirus, for example. Uh, Brazil has the most violent and lethal cope, uh, cop, uh, policy in the world, uh, aging out of 10 young uh, people murdered in Brazil are black, uh, but, but Brazilian society was only touched by, by the theme of, of police violence due to the mobilization on behalf of George Floyd's murder in the US. Uh, racism uh, uh, creates a kind of indifference with with black death, uh, that difference allows for almost one hundred and six five thousand of deaths by COVID nineteen. Because uh, uh, in beginning of pandemic, there was some uh, some research showing the the racial difference in the death, and we 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 know that. Uh, black people are more affected by virus death, but our government uh, and finish it, uh, uh, the collect of of uh, racial data, and we cannot know uh, uh, today who is that. But we can imagine. Uh, but we can imagine also that racism allows uh, uh, the the the, the uh, a kind of indifference. With that, with that, uh, that death, uh, uh, we we have many deaths, but without commotion because uh, the the people uh, when we see uh, which people are dying, we understand the, uh, that indifference. Uh, as told, as told by Down Dawkins, here uh, racism is the key for an even distribution of the national effect of our subordinating section insertion in in the structural crisis of capital uh, i think bolsonaro is just the most recent invisible expression uh, uh, of an ancient black and indigenous genocide but he doesn't begin it uh, post more visible uh, post more, more, uh, more. Uh, what can I say? Uh, uh, hey, is is that post more, more, more visible? Uh, and that's the that, that's the point because is is unbelievable that many intellectuals uh, can uh, talk about social issue without think in racism in the role of racism. Uh, to the development of Brazilian capital, capitalism. That's my point for 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 us in that in that uh, conference. Uh, I I I I will to to to, to talk in, in Portuguese to to present my uh, briefly my my presentation to Brazilian people understand what uh, uh, we are talking. Uh, vou falar em português rapidinho sobre o que eu falei na minha apresentação. Então o que eu coloquei é que o racismo ele é um elemento fundamental para uma análise concreta da questão social. E aí a minha apresentação é uma provocação 
é, a ausência da temática racial ou uma certa periferização da temática racial nos debates estruturais sobre a questão social, uma vez que a questão social é uma questão econômica, é, antes de qualquer coisa, mas no contexto brasileiro, a questão econômica ela é perpassada por dimensões racializadas. E aí eu falo da... da, da para explicar a questão social contemporânea, eu falo da história do Brasil e da expressão colonial de estruturação do capitalismo no Brasil e falo é, o quanto que essa dimensão estrutural ela vai se agravar com a reestruturação produtiva e, e isso vai criar, vai intensificar os efeitos da, da miséria e das desigualdades. Falo também que o governo Bolsonaro é, é, representa uma readequação ultraliberal é, uh, do Estado é, em, em relação aos interesses da, das classes dominantes, mas, sobretudo, para a atual fase de acumulação capitalista, e, de alguma forma, né, é, enfatizo o quanto o racismo é fundamental para entender o capitalismo contemporâneo e, portanto, os efeitos do capitalismo, ou seja, a questão social, e, e sobretudo, né, o quanto que o racismo coloca na sociedade brasileira, uma certa distribuição desigual dos efeitos da barbárie do atual contexto. E aí a minha última pergunta é, será que vidas negras importam? Já que nós só começamos a discutir esse tema de forma ampla diante de uma morte nos Estados Unidos, quando a história do Brasil é marcada pelo genocídio indígena e negro. É isso. É, thank you so much for, for, the, for the possibility of uh, this, this conversation. Wonderful, Davidson. He put us to think uh, Black Lives Matter. This is the, 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 the final question in your uh, speech. Uh, and uh, the topic, it's, it's uh, impact us to think because he, he remembers us that who assassinate Marielle Fran, who assassinates so many black lives in Brazil, day by day. We know who are in the prison, you know, and you show us the extremely poverty and the poverty in Brazil. So we have a wonderful panel and now we have a little question. Easy questions, and I'd like to to introduce you as 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 soon as possible. One question is from um, Bernardo Bragato. He's a, a student for from our master uh, program. He asked to down during the primary, especially Sanders uh, talk a lot about the um, an upcoming universal public public health care system uh, and remember us uh, something like uh, our universal health system that we have in brazil um, now do you believe that he is, uh, is he uh, capable of doing that? Because if we remember, this is a discussion before in Obama, Obama government. Uh, the second question I'm looking for, if I, 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 I lost some question, I will uh, recover. Uh, Larissa Marinho said, uh, it's perfect, this discussion, the capitalism to be appropriation, the territory with use the violence that when we look the our history. And um, let me see, uh, Larissa Marinho asking, what resistance strategy do they perceive as possible in this context very, very conservative? When we look to the reality and uh, so many governments like the reality in Brazil, so I will say in Portuguese, 
fora Bolsonaro. So the example that we have here, some good and perfect example, and we are doing the municipality election and we are facing some challenge. So, and what's the role of social works in that hesitance for both of you? Down and Dimitra. So we are facing uh, the conservative uh, party and the conservative thinking is spread around the world. What should be done for us and the resident as, as the, to be involved in the residence? Mm, let me see one more. Okay, uh, Davidson. Um, in your uh, evaluation, uh, the anti-racist um, struggle in Brazil. What what's your opinion about what we are doing as society in Brazil uh, and the anti-racist uh, struggle? I, we have more questions, but to start the discussion. And finally, just one question for uh, Dimitra. Uh, when we, you present about the refugees crisis, and I remember that we are facing in the, in the border, the Brazilian border between uh, Venezuela. We receive uh, day by day some uh, people come from uh, Brazil across the border and we need to support uh, in so many ways and immediately. In your opinion, uh, what impact the, the refugees cries and the social work and grief now. That's it. Thank you. Who started to answer? You can decide it. Um, so the first question I think was about what will Biden do? Right? Yeah. Um, he's not going to do anything unless we push him. <laughs> he, um, he basically um, came out uh, during his campaign against Bernie's, um, you know, universal health care. He did not support Medicare for all. Um, I, he's not saying now that he supports it, but I think that's the role of the left, right? So what we, our slogan um, when we were working on the campaign was dump Trump combat Biden, right? So that we know that for him to do anything um, that will bring material relief to um, the millions of people that need it, we need to pressure him. And there are people, the one thing that was really great about uh, this election was that more democratic socialists were elected to Congress. There were two more people that went in there, one from Missouri, one from New York. So we have AOC, we have, um, we have, we have more socialists now that are in uh, Congress uh, than we ever had before. And our job as, as the movement is to really, you know, build the working class multiracial movement to force him, <laughs> to force him to uh, do the right thing around healthcare. And we're having conversations about that as we speak now. Our, our, my state, Massachusetts, is already having a planning meeting about that. Thank you. Dora. Okay, uh, let's start from the last question. What was the impact of this refugee crisis and the flow of refugees in the borders for social work and social workers? I think we can see that on many levels. Uh, and it's a kind of contradiction what I'm gonna say because after this refugee crisis, uh, the unemployment for the social workers is very low. The majority of social workers now work with refugees in NGOs, okay? But at the same time, they face the dead ends of these hostile policies against refugees in their day-to-day -day work, 
So we see many young social workers that find job very quickly in the NGOs, hmm? but at the same time, they're alone, they're isolated, with no supervision, hmm? with no good training. So they're, they're alone and the system pushes them to find out solutions, but there is no solution because if the, the state and European Union violate human rights, there is little that social work can do alone. So what I want to say here and um, uh, connected with the other question about resistance and strategy of resistance is that I think that social work and not only social work, social services across Europe and across the globe are uh, in the crossroads, are at the crossroads. And they need now, we need now to decide what kind of social work we will have during the next decades. So what I would like to add in this discussion is that first is important for this strategy of resistance. First it is important to understand the causes, to understand the context, to put all this violation of human rights, all this oppression, as the vision said, to capitalist system and to understand what is happening and why this is happening. Why is this violation of human rights for refugees? This is not another issue than capitalism. This is not another issue. It's really connected. It's the same with fascism. Fascism is integral part of capitalism. So firstly, it's important to understand uh, what's happening. It's important to understand that uh, social work uh, is not there I mean, not to understand, but it's a kind of resistance. Uh, in my point of view, I mean, by the radical point of view of social work, social work is here to think out of the box and resist to this capitalism and bring another social work, another social work that is possible. And how is this possible? Think out of the box, participate in collectivities, don't be alone, resist with uh, uh, movements or resist with the unions and act day-to-day -day practice in a radical perspective. Uh, hope this makes sense and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Davidson, I would like to present two questions. I'd like to add more two questions for you. Uh, one of uh, is here, uh, Bianca Barcelos. She is asking about the, the, the violence uh in colonial period uh, 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 how we let me see here how we influence uh, in our present time our past that the violence that we had and the second question um, Senira uh, asked if you can, Tell us a little more about the structural racism in Brazil and the, um, the discussion, the polemic discussion in nowadays about the uh, reverse uh, racism. Well, nice. I will, I will start talking about resistance strategy. Uh, first, I think progressive force needs to reorganize. Uh, we are living a beautiful example here in the bonus election today because different political forces are uh, working together. That is important. I, I, I have hope uh, uh, with that process. But I think for, for progressive force to reorganize, it's fundamental to dare to dream of a different society. It's fundamental uh, uh, to put uh, ourselves in a radical perspective, because uh, one of the possible criticism to to the left in Brazil is that she became a defender of order against conserva conservatism, and uh, the one who sh uh, channeled discontent was the righteous extreme. That is, is crazy because uh, that is important to to us to think about, but. Uh, uh, the, the, the left, uh, I think, the, the left needs to, to settle the score with their Eurocentrism. 
and racism also, especially in, in, in the continent like America, where capitalism was marked by uh, indigenous genocide and, and, and black slavery. It's important because we cannot, uh, we cannot think only in Europe, European terms when the, the class struggle uh, has a, a particularity here in, in our, our region. That is important, but it's a difficult uh, issue. Uh, but I think uh, th 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 that is, uh, there are important uh, uh, paths in, in that direction. Uh, I think uh, uh, black movement uh, today uh, is an interesting uh, topic. Uh, Florestan Fernandes uh, said that the black movement had two tasks, one within the order, uh, struggle for representation uh, in a space of power, for example, or struggle for affirmative action. But uh, uh, in Brazil, black population are, are the majority. Uh, and, and that puts a particularity for black, black struggle in Brazil, uh, uh, because uh, 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 for Florestan, uh, 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 in addiction, uh, if we attending to their social demands uh, in, in the country where black people are majority, uh, it, it implies breaking with the social order. It puts the, the, the black uh, reivindication in the, in the struggle against the order, against capitalism. That's interesting because Black Lives, black lives Matter is a, a nice example and black, black people in the US uh, uh, are not majority, but uh, 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 they put the, 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 the racial question in the context of the structural crisis of capital. That's, that is an interesting to, to think uh, or challenge it today, but I think to, to think black movement today is important uh, uh, to understand that that movement movement has uh, two tasks I think uh, one is defense of universal flags because black people are the most affected by uh, 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 poverty and capitalism uh, and the universal flags are important for black people uh, for example uh, today, uh, uh, the defense of universal health system are an important task for black struggle because uh, black people are the most uh, uh, de uh, dependent of public health. Uh, we are we have a, a, a public health that, but uh, 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 there are uh, institutional racism in, uh, inside of public health that creates. Uh, difference and unequal of access to equipments and, and services of health. Uh, but it's important to defend public health, defend uh, 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 university and, and, and education, but mainly uh, to fight against neoliberalism because black population uh, uh, will be more affected by this effect. But I think uh, that is also a specific, a specific task uh, that are that is advocating uh, to specific policy uh, uh, in combat. Uh, uh, that's important. Also, I think we we, we can combine uh, uh, these two demands. The uh, uh, the question of violence is interesting. I have no time to uh, to explore it, but I, I I want to say that Marx. Uh, talk about uh, uh, the violent dimension of primitive uh, uh, accumulation of capital. But uh, Rosa Luxemburgo uh, shows, uh, because Marx, Marx didn't see uh, a monopol monopolist capitalist, uh, uh, monopolist capital, for example, but uh, Rosa Luxemburgo, uh, yes, and, and, and she said that that violence, that uh, primitive violence, uh, uh, was not a thing uh, uh, that, uh, uh, for example, stay only in, in, in this initial uh, uh, moment of capital, but is part of development of capital in, in your, in, in its uh, uh, development uh, phase. It, it's, it's put the importance to think colonialism and violence because uh, colonialism permits transfer uh, structural violence 
for outside of central system and our societies our peripheral societies are marked by that violence that that are uh that is a, a structural violence but it's it's part of development of capital and our society is marked by that violence and, and, and that violence continues today but even in the center culture that violence is part also but uh, that violence is is uh distributed by uh immigrants people uh people from ex colony for example uh is in, in, is extremely important to understand the colonial aspect of uh, uh current capitalism Co uh, colonialism is not a uh, answered uh, topic but is a, a current topic um uh, thank you very much our time it's finish unfortunately i have so many questions to uh down dixon and and uh dimitra but unfortunately we need to to end the section the panel uh to summarize maybe we can say we need to be involved we need to be a dream to another society not to be to think in the box. We need to think out of the box. Uh, muito obrigada a todos e a todos que ficaram aqui com a gente, que fizeram essas questões e que a gente possa sonhar por um novo, em um novo mundo, um mundo onde não caiba qualquer tipo de discriminação e que as vidas negras, cuja resposta a gente dê para o Davidson, é, seja, sim, vidas negras importam. Uh, I, I'd like to, to say that, to answer the question that Dave Santura uh, proposed us, that in the end, we need to think outside the box, out of the box, and answer Dave Son, Black Lives Matter. Thank you very much. I, I promise that we will find another opportunity to listen more Dimitra, Down, Davidson, and other colleagues who will uh, share their knowledge. Thank you, thank you very much, and have a, a wonderful day. E, lembrando a todos, a próxima sessão começa em 22 minutos. Thank you, bye. Bye. Obrigada.